had an opportunity, and I really do think of it as an opportunity, to show that we too could sacrifice for one another. And I think the question that I most underestimated was, would we be willing to say that none of us are more important than all of us, or would we fall into the pattern that most people would have thought we would have fallen into, which is to say that no, we each individually are more important. And I think it's one of the reasons we've suffered so greatly. 700,000 Americans now have lost their lives to COVID. One person is dying in America every 43 seconds. One in 500 Americans are dead now. Biden's first year could be defined more by COVID than anything else. Remember, Biden is the guy that said, by 4th of July, if you just stick with me and wear the masks, we're gonna, we won't have to do that anymore. And that's just not the case. CC scientists told us that we really have 12 years within which we must make and implement the key decisions to avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. And unfortunately, we lost three years during the Trump administration where we pulled out of the Paris Agreement. I do believe that this is our be last sort of best chance Trump withdraw not from to that. solve it all in one blow here, but to get on the track where we keep 1.5 degrees alive as the limit of the raising of temperature in the planet. How are you doing? Do you think we'll be successful? I Call do indeed. Say. Yes, I do. Keep your fingers crossed then, eh? Yes, sir. Thank you. By and large, the Biden administration has been highly disciplined, highly coordinated. I love it. I love the accent. I love that. I love that. Uh... Fingers crossed. Do you? <laughs> but John Kerry is a former Secretary of State, a former presidential nominee himself. This is the last big job of his career. And he felt like he could say what he wanted to go say. And so on China, they were not, at times, on the same page. I think it's been a big mistake, quite frankly, for China, and with respect to China, not showing up. The rest of the world you know, looked at China and say, what value added are they, are they provide? came as a surprise that Biden offered really strong criticism to Xi for not coming himself to Glasgow because the Kerry strategy on China was largely to work behind closed doors, avoid sort of any open conflicts. I have to imagine it was strategic. What we know now is that they were brokering this sort of last minute US-China pact last days of Glasgow. And so one has to assume there was some pause, rift, something in the discussions that would have led this administration to think this will help. The US and China have struck a deal on climate change. The announcement came during the COP26 summit in Glasgow. The United States and China have no shortage of differences, but on climate, on climate, Cooperation is the only way to get this job done. This U.S.-China announcement is both huge and kind of small. You know, it's small in the sense that none of this stuff is truly groundbreaking. 
but I think in that moment, just the two of them coming out publicly and saying, we're going to work together, we're committed, it was a big deal. The Biden administration came in as the Trump administration went out with a clear focus on China. China is definitely in that old Cold War terms of a system challenge saying that its system is better than ours. But Russia is saying, hey, it's not just about China. We're here and we matter and you'd better pay attention to us. we began to pick up a variety of indications that the Russians were conducting a significant, significant would be an understatement, massive military buildup around Ukraine. They have so much forward firepower that they are assembling. Um, it's on a level that is not comparable to what they did in April. The president decided that we would begin down a dual track of deterrence on the one hand and diplomacy on the other. So we asked Bill Burns to go to Moscow quietly. The president asked me to go to Moscow to convey to President Putin and some of his most senior advisors our serious concern about what we were seeing. This was in the midst of the fourth big wave of the COVID pandemic in Russia, so Moscow was locked down. President Putin was in isolation in Sochi at that point. I found President Putin to be quite measured, but unapologetic about Russian concerns about Ukraine. I think over time, his confidence has grown. In some ways, his appetite for risk has grown. I think his sense of personal legacy has probably deepened over time. I conveyed on the president's behalf a message of serious consequences that would flow from a Russian decision to renew military aggression against Ukraine. We wanted to communicate that if Putin moved on Ukraine, there would be severe consequences from the United States and our allies. If Putin wanted to go down the diplomatic road, the United States was prepared to travel that road with him. President Biden holding a high stakes virtual meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin right now. The two leaders speaking via video conference today as a potential geopolitical crisis is currently unfolding. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you again. I. Uh... Unfortunately, we didn't get to see one another at the G20. I hope next time we meet, we do it in person. The buildup that Russia was engaged in was continuing. We had to have, and we did have, deep, deep concern. Like all the conversations between President Biden and President Putin, have now been several in person in Geneva, by video conference, on the phone. They're very direct, they're not polemical, there's not a lot of wasted time. And President Biden made very clear to President Putin that if Russia committed renewed acts of aggression against Ukraine, there would be significant costs. Biden is confronting the question of how does the United States support Ukraine without getting its troops directly into an old time border conflict in defense of a country that isn't even a NATO ally. And when Biden had his teleconference with Putin, the two men knew one thing. Whatever Putin did next, whether he rolled his troops or not, the U.S. was not going to put its own military into harm's way to defend Ukraine. Why did Putin decide to take U.S. ground combat troops off the table when it comes to Ukraine? They never were on the table. And are you ready to send American troops into war and go into Ukraine to fight Russians on their battlefield? Look, here's the deal. I've made it absolutely clear to President Putin, it's the last thing I'll say, that if he moves on Ukraine, the economic consequences for his economy are going to be devastating. 
devastating. We have proceeded very deliberately, but also in some cases quietly. For example, in December, the president approved of $200 billion for additional defense equipment to Ukraine. We didn't advertise it at the time, we just went forward with doing it because one of the plays in the Russian playbook is to create, invent, point to some kind of provocation and to use that as justification for something they've been planning all along. And we did not want to play into that, at least not in any uh, overt way. The question haunting the White House is whether this is enough. Because if Ukraine falls, Russia will, for the first time since the collapse of the Soviet Union, be redrawing the map of Europe. And more importantly, it will be showing that it believes it can push back on a world that was dominated by the United States from the Soviet collapse forward. This January 6th, solemn ceremonies at the U.S. Capitol replaced the violent scenes of rioters ransacking the building one year ago. There is still a political divide that's very apparent, and even with today's ceremonies as well. Among my many reactions on January 6th was just mortification at how we appear to the rest of the world this day is a reminder that trumpism is very much with us and that our democracy remains very much at risk let us acknowledge today our fallen heroes of that day i ask all members to rise for a moment of silence in their memory what else are democrats you know talk about they're going to talk about 30-year high inflation. They're going to talk about the fact crime's up in every major urban area. They're going to talk about 1.7 million illegal immigrants coming to this country. They're going to talk about the attacks on the First Amendment. Um, what are they going to talk about? Oh, so January 6th. That today there are members of Congress trying to act like that wasn't a big deal. We should just move on. I find hard to uh, be reconciled with. And there's not much more we can say. We'll keep backgrounding and also marketing reporters. But we started discussing in the fall what that day would look like and what that should mean for the president and what he should have to say on that day. We all agreed that it was an important moment for him to be more direct about what that day meant, what former President Trump's role in that day meant for history and why we need to prevent it from ever happening again. All right, guys, um, we will catch up with you soon. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all your stuff. Um, big day. Uh, we saw with our own eyes. Rioters menace these halls. What did we not see? We didn't see a former president who had just rallied the mob to attack, sitting in the private dining room off the Oval Office in the White House, watching it all on television and doing nothing for hours. It didn't mean that it was the start of every day President Biden was gonna go out and talk about Donald Trump, but that day felt like it uniquely required President Biden to go out and really be direct and call out the former president for his role. Those who stormed this Capitol and those who called on them to do so held a dagger at the throat of America. Make no mistake about it, we're living at an inflection point in history. We're engaged anew in a struggle between democracy and autocracy. From China to Russia and beyond, they're betting that democracy's days are numbered. Good afternoon, everyone. Very good to see folks here. And to those I haven't had a chance to uh, say this to, Happy New Year. Uh, this morning, 
NATO's North Atlantic Council met to discuss our coordinated response to Russia's military buildup along the Ukraine border and its increasingly sharp threats and inflammatory rhetoric. No one should be surprised if Russia instigates a provocation or incident, then tries to use it to justify military intervention, hoping that by the time the world realizes the ruse, it'll be too late. We were working overtime to organize allies and partners throughout Europe. They also wanted to make sure that we were proceeding in a deliberate way and not being perceived as fueling a fire in any way. Vladimir Putin didn't pick Ukraine for nothing. He knew that it wasn't a member of NATO. And I think deep down he thought the NATO alliance would be splintered on the question of whether or not to gather together to push him back. When he went into Crimea in 2014, it took about a year for the Allies to get together and decide on some sanctions. And by that time, the sanctions were so weakened, they had basically no effect. Eight years later, Putin was still in Crimea. Biden wasn't going to make that mistake again. Blinken sure as hell wasn't going to make that mistake again because he remembered it vividly from the time that he was in the Obama administration. So when they first saw this massing of troops, they made a very important decision, which was to declassify their intelligence as quickly as they could and publish it. We have information that indicates Russia has already pre-positioned a group of operatives to conduct a false flag operation in eastern Ukraine. Sometimes they went out and announced it. Sometimes they leaked it to us. The U.S. National Security Advisor says more details will be revealed within the next 24 hours. In a few cases, they called a few of us in and did show some sources and methods just so that we understood they weren't making it up. They knew it would take a while to convince the Europeans that this was no bluff. By mid to late January, not only was Russia still building up forces to the east and the south, but it was engaged in a buildup to the north, particularly sending 30,000 forces to Belarus under the guise of exercises that gave it the option to really hit Ukraine virtually from all sides. It was becoming so clear, including to allies and partners, that this was happening. Our view is this is an extremely dangerous situation. We are now at a stage where Russia could at any point launch an attack in Ukraine. We said that one of the purposes of our foreign policy was to defend this rules-based order because it comes with certain principles, certain norms, certain expectations that grew out of two world wars. If we let an aggression against those rules go forward with impunity, then you open a Pandora's box and you're going to see potentially conflict and war everywhere. And that's one way or another going to draw us in. You've seen country after country coming together, standing up. I think it has been a reassertion of American engagement, American leadership, and a recommitment by many countries to defend this rules-based order. discussion today with Minister Lavrov was frank and substantive. We made clear to the Russians that not only would there be severe economic and financial consequences, but they would also see more support to build up NATO's defensive capacities. As we continue to see the accumulation of combat power, and as we have now seen that so far anyway, Mr. Putin has not elected to de-escalate. All that combined has led us to want to contribute more capabilities to Ukrainian armed forces and be ready to contribute more capabilities to our NATO allies. Who knows what's going on in Putin's mind? Whether or not he believes that the international community will carry through is one issue. Uh, but what I believe is that our president is very serious. I believe that other uh, leaders uh, in the region are very serious. I believe that the world will take this as a, as, as a very, very serious uh, uh, issue if he invades Ukraine. We just hope that he makes the right decisions.
and uh, and I'll leave it at that. He went off to the opening of the Beijing Olympics. The very fact that he was going there was remarkable because he'd been in complete isolation. When Bill Burns went over, he made Burns go over to a Russian government office and call Putin on the phone. But he was willing to go see Xi Jinping. And the day that they met, the two countries turned out this extraordinarily long document describing their common interests, their dedication to working together in the future, their joint pushback on an America that sets the rules, on a West that expands its influence. A lot of people speculated that Putin would not begin the invasion while the Olympics were on, because he wouldn't want to anger the Chinese by interrupting their big event. And he held true to that. It was unprovoked, but Russian President Vladimir Putin unleashed on Ukraine. We have heard February the 24th is whenever one of the biggest mistakes on a global perspective could and has ever been made. And the reason why that we know this today is because about nine months later, this is October the 30th, 2022, we can not only see how that the ground has basically shifted in so many different countries pertaining to the escalating prices of fuel, the escalating prices of grain, the escalating prices of food in general. But now we can see because of our lack of ability to truly put global warming on a pedestal and where it needed to be 30, 40 plus years ago, today, because of the events that's happening not only here in America, but globally pertaining to a phenomenon where reservoirs, where watersheds, where rivers, where lakes used to be plentiful, now are not. A matter of fact, we've just got through experiencing one of the worst uh depleting, water depleting events in the mighty Mississippi River towards the river getting so low that it basically halted the barge uh, traffic that is projected to cost the American taxpaying people somewhere around $20 billion because of this ongoing catastrophe that is unfolding right in front of our very eyes on a very, very slow motion level. Not only are we seeing that, but we're seeing other water reservoirs, such as Lake Mead. Uh, we're seeing that the underground water table pertaining to the Ecuador system is also um, becoming crucially low here in America because of the strenuous, um, the strenuous situations with, with so many immigrants, illegal immigrants coming over here to America that's putting a strain on the resources, and also we're seeing this in Mexico itself with their water supply. We're seeing this in places all over the world, and just this year alone, not only has there been a major drought here in America, but there's been droughts over in Europe, over in the UK, over in Germany. There's been droughts over in, uh, in massive amounts of uh, accelerating droughts. Uh, uh, weather events over in in Africa, as well as China, as well as other places all over the world. 
So you may be asking, well, how come you wanted to put this on the end of that in which what they had started in talking about uh, bringing alliances together to be able to fight against global warming? How come you wanted to bring this up towards the, the latter end of this? Simple. Rather than the exchange of war that's happening right now over in Russia pertaining to the Ukrainians, being part of the solution to the problem, it's actually contributing to the problem. First of all, there's lots and lots of waste in war. Second of all, there's lots and lots of, of uh, collateral damage pertaining to the loss of life in war. And thirdly, whenever it comes to using resources, you can use an extensive amount of resources that will basically halt or put the rest of the world in a state of decline because now the resources are having to go towards the war while the rest of the people sacrifice on account of it. In other words, they'll put restrictions. They'll, uh, they'll ration gas. They'll ration tires. They'll ration these things whenever a major conflict is going on. And that's only part of the problem. You may be asking, what's the rest of the problem? The rest of the problem is that the world has been focused upon this maniac, poisonous Putin, doing what he's doing to the Ukrainian people over there, in which I still believe that how Congress acted with Donald J. Trump and how that Donald J. Trump was going to try to manipulate the Ukrainians, even though we had promised that we was going to give them military backing, Donald J. Trump wanted to blackmail them by using it as some sort of a prying tool for his own advantage. It was Donald J. Trump that whenever poisonous Putin first invaded the Ukrainians that said that poisonous Putin was a genius. During which time that we have lost another nine months of not paying close enough attention to the atmospheric condition changes that's not only happening above our heads but happening below our feet, it has put us that much further in behind the eight ball in identifying that these problems pertaining to environmental changes have only gotten worse and are going to continue to get worse and they wanted to put some sort of a timeline, Heinz 57, wanted to put some sort of a timeline that, that they put it on a 12-year uh, deal, but we've already done lost three of those years in reversing the 1.5 degree differences of the planet. I personally believe you've lost not just three years, but you've lost your window of opportunity to actually reversing the problem. Now, does that mean that we are at the point of doom that we shouldn't try to pursue in reversing this? No. What it means is the problems that we have already brought upon to ourselves will probably continue to be that way, even if we was to take everything um, surrounding petroleum crude oil uh, pertaining to how that we are damaging the planet by draining these these critical um, resources out of the ground that we would probably still have to deal with these phenomenon weather events that's occurring even as I speak, but we possibly could prevent from it getting worse. In other words, we're not going to be able to prevent that 1.5 degree dif uh, temperature difference as NASA and NOAA and other major science institutions has, has talked about, but maybe we could prevent it from getting even worse towards instead of 1.5, 2.5, or 3.5, or even or, or even further than that. Because what we're doing to our planet, it's as if now, since COVID has hit, everything has accelerated. And now we can see not only the medical 
um, imbalances that COVID has caused. But now we can also see the pre-existing sicknesses that was already there that we wasn't paying a close enough attention to pertaining to pre-COVID before COVID ever hit. Not only was we not paying close enough attention to various health situations that even right now uh, it's attacking our children and the hospitals are basically full because of this particular virus that has inundated a great deal of the children. But we're also seeing where these um, respiratory problems are intensifying in ways like we never would have imagined before COVID that now we're recognizing and seeing all over the world. If you'll combine that with the rivers going low, with the lakes going low, with other water resources pertaining to watersheds, etc., going low, we have put ourselves in a very, very aquarius, difficult state as a global society to survive if we continue to avoid the subject matter in regards towards draining fossil fuel from our planet. As of a day or two ago, I was over in Middle Tennessee, up around up around the um, Humphreys County area, Stewart County, Humphreys County area, um, doing some look and looking around and, and uh, enjoying myself with the red lens of Galway Bash. Farewell, go away, bash, pertaining to him having a a, uh, a rodeo and and uh, other events out that way, uh, pertaining to a concert, towards basically people um, ending of the season, pertaining to the loss of a country and western entertainer star that had recently passed. But I also got an opportunity of speaking to various people while I was out in the field investigating and doing my thing, as well as mixing a little bit of pleasure with business as far as looking at the color content of the trees and the fog, etc. But in doing so, I even have come to the realization, even more so today, than what, it, what I was at 72 hours ago, about the urgency, the urgency-ness that still has not been focused properly upon to various countries in taking all this stuff serious. And I tend to wonder if we're not repeating the same patterns as what we did whenever COVID first hit towards one day we was to put on our mask. The next day we wasn't supposed to put on our mask. Donald Trump wanted people to drink bleach. Uh, we're just going to do this. Oh, it wasn't no big deal on that. Uh, should we keep schools going? Should we all go, uh, um, you know, cyber pertaining to trying to teach our children, uh, still keeping them involved in in, um, in educational uh, needs? Um, we didn't take COVID serious. And that's one reason why COVID sprung as hard as what it did towards doing the damages that it did, because we did not initiate that problem properly on the front end of the problem. I can basically look at the same thing with the petroleum atmospheric environmental crisis that certain people have taken serious why others are still calling it a hoax. Same way with the election deniers. We still have people that have swallowed hook, line, and sinker that the occurrences that Donald Trump was persuading the American people towards 
that the election had been stolen. We still have people out there that believe in these things. And you know what? I've come to the conclusion we're probably going to continue to have people that believe in a lie because even Jesus said that mankind loves darkness better or more so than they like light. That humanity loves darkness and a lie is part of darkness. Disinformation is part of darkness. Not telling the truth is part of darkness. And because of these things, there will be certain people out there that will live for the rest of their living long days that will not be convinced of the big lie that Donald Trump was telling the American people. That was, in fact, a lie, but it was coming from Donald Trump pertaining to him knowing that he had lost the election. Just like there's going to be people that's going to continue to deny environmental changes of what we're doing to ourselves down here up onto the planet probably until the very day that they die because they are convinced that they rather believe in a lie they rather follow darkness than they would light pertaining to the truth so this is where we are we have now spent Give or take, uh, give or take about uh, nine or ten months in watching poisonous Putin try to genocide a people over in Ukraine that could care less about any life whatsoever, regardless whether it was hospitals, clinics, fraternity wards parks, schools, basically any and all of your civilian life that could basically care less about all of that. And because of that, we have been focusing a great deal of attention on that, which once more, we have lost another nine or ten months in taking the matter serious about global warming. In the meantime, we have lakes, we have rivers, we have watersheds, we have water preserve systems set up to maintain the structure of survival here upon to the planet that are now depleting even as I speak. Oh yeah, it may have come a shower last night here. Um, it was raining off and on. We may have gotten maybe a quarter of inch of rain, but what is a quarter of inch of rain in comparison to Lake Mead that has dropped since 1983, 175 feet in comparison to where it should be today that stood that much water in 1983 before we started seeing this major decline of moisture no longer being put back into the Colorado River where the Hoover Dam is. There's no way for me to be able to prove the earth is warming up from the inside. I don't have an instrument to be able to put in the ground to tell you this is what's actually occurring. But what we can see is the consequences and the circumstances in not acting appropriately in various places in the ocean. That's 18 to 2200 degrees that you can drive for hundreds of miles down in the ocean. Should have said float or swim. That the ocean bottom of the of the floor is just erupting in nothing but solid recourse from molten molta lava that, that's coming up from from the from the bottom of the ocean we have right now approximately uh give or take about 40 or 50 volcanoes that's erupting 
probably about a dozen of those are above the earth, and the rest of them are below the earth, below the water. But we're seeing major, major infrastructure damages pertaining to our roads and our bridges that are depleting, that are drying up, that are cracking, that are basically just crumbling right below, right, right beneath our feet. And for some reason, science has not wanted to poke or, or put a great deal of emphasis on the earth is actually warming up from the inside out versus the outside in. Why they have done this, I don't know. I know that if I can see it and if other people can see it, especially towards the way that it's intensifying, they should be able to see it too as well. We don't know if they're not explaining it to, to the people, not just the American people, but the global society, because they don't want to start some sort of a, a um, frenzy, don't want to start a panic. But I personally believe that that's exactly where we should be. We should be in a panic mode in understanding that the more precious resources that we drain out of Mother Earth, the more consequences that are going to happen because of it. We know that the ocean is rising. We know that various things is happening extremely unordinary pertaining to these deluges on one perspective, but droughts on the other. Everything has become disproportionalized away from its normalcy that now It has resonated into imbalances that are absolutely 100% totally undeniable. Totally undeniable, regardless whether it's the events that's happening here in America pertaining to our rivers and streams or other places of the world that are suffering similar fates. The reason why that I wanted to listen to this again and I wanted to record part of this again, is strictly because of the severity of where we are as a global society. And if we continue on the path that we are on, we will not only not stop the 1.5 degrees from excelling into the areas that scientists are now trying to say we don't need to go off into, but it's a possibility that these increases of temperatures will increase and compass the 1.5 degrees. And it won't be in a 12 or a 10 or a 9 year period that Heinz 57 man wanted to talk about. But it will be drastically approaching right in front of our very eyes. Because why? Because we have been distracted. Because why? Because we wanted to pay more attention to what was going on with Putin and the Ukrainians than what we should have been paying attention to all along pertaining to what the climate deniers, including Donald Trump, wanted to instill up into the world while knowing something was tragically happening in our atmosphere as well as the things up under our feet. This very well could be the very last warning that the world can obtain before we drastically see these temperatures exceeding more than 1.5 degrees just within the next few years, not no 8 or 10 or 12 years. I cannot emphasize on the importance of urgency of where we are right now towards waking up to that in which what we have regrettably done to ourselves and this planet in not wanting to pay close enough attention to the signs and the consequences in the damages of natural catastrophes that are now hitting all over the planet. And as these natural catastrophes are hitting, keep in mind, 
put it in the right perspective that the Bible talks about, woe be unto the inhabitants here upon to the planet, whenever you shall see these things, as these occurrences are happening, it is steadily draining and depleting the resources that mankind, humanity, must have in order to survive. Because if we don't have adequate food, if we don't have adequate water, if we don't have adequate this and adequate that, not only do we take a chance on massive extinction pertaining to sufferings like humanity could never ever begin to famine or conceive towards it actually being a reality, but it could actually reach the level that we could no longer even begin to dream or desire or have a to have a vision of being able to reverse it, much less stop it. I cannot emphasize on the material that I have tried to bring out to the world in regards to these issues enough of the urgencies of where we and what we should be doing. I bumped into an individual uh, yesterday within... I'm going to say a thousand feet of I-40, Interstate 40. I don't forgot now what county that it was in, but it was just north of, of Humphreys County uh, on a place called uh, Bucksnort, at, by the Bucksnort exit on the Bucksnort Road. And me talking to this individual that had lived out there in one of the oldest historical places in that particular county that, that had been passed down from generation to generation pertaining to a, an old homestead, he was convinced that the American, that our governments, not necessarily the American governments, but our governments in general, has a plan towards wanting to starve out the world in ending are slowing down or reducing the population. He was convinced that government officials are in control of the weather. He is convinced that the government officials are purposely doing this in raising the prices of food to the degree that it's going to cause more crime, to the degree it's going to cause more starvation, to the degree that it's going to cause more anguish and pain. He was convinced that our government is behind this on a intentional mindset form of them purposely doing this. I'll agree that our governments, because of carelessness because of gross negligence has allowed for this to come up into our lives and in a way I guess because of that you can say yeah our government is behind all these events but in a indirect way I don't think that they realize the severity of all this because why because the Bible talks about how that the blind will lead the blind, and they both shall lead it off into the ditch. This could very well be the last warning to not just the American government, but the governments in general. That if you do not put these issues on the very, very front burner, in trying to resolve this quickly and effectively and efficiently, we may very well have crossed over the Rubicon of no return. And if that be the case, that means that we will see massive extinctions, we will see massive starvations. We will see massive sufferings such as humanity cannot even begin to famine. 
That's why I continue to put video after video after video after video, either on Facebook or YouTube, pertaining to my social media platform, because I know the urgencies of where we are. I know what has occurred 30 plus years ago, and I know where we was almost 40 years ago in comparison to where we are today. As a witness, as one of the witnesses, I can vouch to say that the path that the world is on is a doomsday path if they don't put these issues on the front burner and do so immediately with all urgency. With all urgency at these requests. And if you don't, you're only going to be bringing that much more death and destruction to your own citizens. And it doesn't matter if it's the American government that's bringing this on to their American citizens or the Russian government or the China government or the Mexico government or the India government or the Africa government whatever government that does not pay close enough attention to the things that are being talked about on this particular video, they will bring the blood of innocence upon to their own feet. The fault will fall upon to the feet of these officials that does not act according to where we are today. Like I said, yes, we got a shower last night here in Northwest Tennessee, and I'm so proud of it. And I've already done looked at the weather uh, deal, and there's been other uh, um, major corridors going off into the Mississippi, pertaining to rivers and, and stuff like that, that's received some rain north of us as well as south of us. So these are all good things in trying to reverse the drought that, absolutely just frightens me to death every time we, we get in this type, type of a, a dryness this time of year of knowing what went on in the Appalachian Mountains in 2007 pertaining to the great fires, knowing that in also 2007, I think it was, um, I don't forget the name of the lake now, down by Atlanta, almost dried like 80% up to the point that the governor got out on the, uh, on the, uh, Capitol building and beg people to start praying for weather adjustments pertaining to rain. Whenever you have these type of events that are happening on this level, it's no longer a matter of should we put this on priority list, but it's a matter of how come you hadn't already put this on priority list. I cannot emphasize enough of the importance of what is happening to our planet. And if our government officials does not take these things serious, they are only bringing destruction into their very own existences. Thanks again and good luck to each and every one of us. We want to say God bless those that are taking these matters serious, just like the seriousness of what went on or is going on right now with the Ukrainians, how that poisonous Putin has stepped way over the line pertaining to the Geneva agreements in attacking uh, citizens, same way with Saudi Arabia that has basically been stepping over the line now for years and years and years, not only in their high-profile financial financing uh, terrorist campaigns, but also in the way that we have seen the way that they hit themselves has attacked uh, the Yemens in blowing up churches and, and synagogues and, and weddings and funerals and, and basically attacking just the civilian life. And to think that we were steadily selling them bombs to do this puts the blood of innocence on our hands, on our feet 
and supplying a government, if you want to call the Saudi Arabian uh, establishment a government, I don't call it a government. I call it something else that I can't say on this particular film right here. But they are cold-blooded. They are the very axes of evil. They are the ones that masterminded 9-11. They are the ones that thought that it was cute to kill an American journalist, cut him up in little bitty pieces and carry him out in suitcases. They thought that it was okay to support and finance all these major terrorist groups, regardless whether it was the Taliban that basically went in and physically took back over Afghanistan 11 days later after we walked out of that situation, or those that are being financed right now, even as I speak, that we're not even aware of. We know for a fact there's something like 67, 70 known independent terrorist groups over in Afghanistan and in the surrounding Middle East. And those are just the ones that we know about. It's basically struggle to the finish towards who's going to be the king of the mountain over there. And to think that we attacked Saddam Hussein that, yes, was doing some things to his own people that, he, that, that by and large, um, in our set of standards, was not proper or right. But at least he was maintaining a somewhat of order, doing what he was doing towards dealing with that type of a people. When we took him out, as it has been said before, it created a vacuum for that many more terrorists to inundate that area. And instead of the Americans using the strategy that we was going to bring stability into that area, including Iran, Iraq, all those other areas, it's actually done, it's actually had an opposite effect. Instead of bringing stability, it's brought more instability. And of course, whenever you're dealing with what we're dealing right now with Putin and the Ukrainians, it's just intensifying the problems, exacerbating the problems that much more in bringing that much more instability into other countries now. But it's also a reminder that we are being led down this rabbit hole of concentrating our, our, our thoughts and our, and our uh, resources towards the Ukrainians, in which we should, but it's basically being used as a tool or, or being weaponized to the degree that because we're doing that, it's kind of like setting a fire, creating a diversion, you set a fire on one side of town while everybody's going to the, to the side of town to put the fire out. You're going to the opposite side of town towards robbing the bank. It's a diversion. And I continue to keep saying that about certain situations that obviously are not being paid attention to. Are not being taken serious. Even my own son made mention, Dad, isn't nobody paying any attention to you. They're not taking any of the things that you're talking about serious. Well, they may not be. But I guarantee you one day in the hereafter world, they won't have me to come up to and grab me by the shirt of the collar and say, how come you didn't warn us? How come, Juby, you didn't tell us the things that God had showed you to show us? Well, you know what? I have. I have showed you. I have hit you again and again and again with video after video after video trying to put that message out the same way as Noah continuously continued to preach to the people that if you didn't straighten your act up, God was fixing to bring destruction into your lives too as well. And as soon as Noah finished the boat, according to the historical finds of the Bible that now can be proved, proven even by science that did actually occur because they have found the boat. Some are stuck in the hills of Turkey over there, part of it. 
that those same people will not be able to walk up and grab Noah or some of the other prophets of God that's been called of God towards being a messenger. They can't come up to us and grab us by the, by the spiritual collar and say, how come you didn't do what God had called you to do? Because in most situations, most of these prophets of God, most of these messengers, most of these witnesses that was given these instructions by God has done just exactly what God told them to do. And they used it in their own accord and people avoided them, ignored them, made fun of them, ridiculed them, demonized them and dehumanized them until the very last day. And then as they was laying on their very deathbeds, just like David Jacobs was laying on his deathbed a few years ago, that looked up to me whenever I went and visited this man less than a half a mile from where I live today and said, Juby, I wish we would have supported you and I wished that we would have taken more interest in believing in you. And within a matter of a few days or weeks, he was dead. And of course, once you're dead, you're dead. We don't have the power to reverse death. And because things was not handled properly, I'm sure that David Jacobs went to his deathbed regretting that he did not pay close enough attention to one of God's instructors, to one of God's messengers towards putting out the truth to not just the American people, but to the world. Now, we have seen this happen again and again and again and again throughout history. Whenever God would send forth a messenger such as Moses, such as Noah, such as other prophets of God, including God's only begotten Son himself, Jesus Christ, that there towards the last, even he had become disoriented in that in which what his father had called him to do by going up into the mountains and saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I have gathered you together as a hen would gather her chicklings, but ye would not listen. Do you not think that the people that not only crucified Christ, but the people in that surrounding area suffered immensely because they did not listen to Christ? Leading all the way to the Jewish Holocaust that happened about 75 plus years ago? All you got to do is look at the history towards what has occurred since the crucifixion of Jesus Christ over in the Middle East. How chaotic that, that area has been. And even, even uh, Jesus said that whenever you shall see uh, Jerusalem accomplished with armies, know that the desolation is nigh. Know as that the desolation is nigh. About when would we call it an invasion? When was it the right time to send the president out? When was it the right time to do a written statement? The president spoke with President Zelensky, who basically asked him to condemn what was happening and to keep rallying the world. I mean, those were his primary asks, and that's exactly what he went out the next day and, and did. February the 24th. Sorry to keep you waiting. Good afternoon. The Russian military has begun a brutal assault on the people of Ukraine. Without provocation, without justification, without necessity, this is a premeditated attack. Vladimir Putin has been planning this for months, as I've been, we've been saying all along. The Biden administration learned a lot of lessons from the mistakes they made in Afghanistan. 
By the time that the Ukraine crisis came along, they had a better oiled machine and they responded by getting out ahead of events instead of being behind them. For weeks, for weeks, we have been warning that this would happen. And now it's unfolding largely as we predicted. It will be difficult for any intelligence agency to predict the outcome of this war or how the Russian army or the Ukrainians will ultimately perform. But on the timing of the invasion, they got everything right. As murky as they were about how quickly the Taliban would take over Afghanistan, they had the Ukraine thing dead on. I want to be clear. The United States is not doing this alone. For months, we've been building a coalition of partners representing well more than the global economy. The German Chancellor Olaf Scholz says that he is suspending the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project with Russia. The sanctions portées à la Russie seront à la hauteur de l'agression dont elles seront coupables. The European Union remains resolutely united as it takes the next step in close coordination with its partners. You know, for the first half of the year, we heard Biden talking about re-establishing old alliances, listening to people, building up what Donald Trump had tried to shatter. And you know, I think to most of the country, that sounded like diplomatic gobbledygook, like, yeah, sure, it's nice to get along with allies. But Biden knew something, which was the moment would come when you would need that alliance. It came with Ukraine. The United States and our allies and partners will continue to respond to Russia's actions with unity, with clarity, and with conviction. This last week, because of the confluence of a number of events that in many ways were unrelated, it was a wild, crazy, exhausting week here. One of the more challenging weeks uh, since we started. sought to shake the very foundations of the free world, thinking he could make it bend to his menacing ways. But he badly miscalculated. He thought he could roll into Ukraine and the world would roll over. Instead, he met with a wall of strength he never anticipated or imagined. He met the Ukrainian people. thought he could divide us in Europe as well, but Putin was wrong. We are ready. We are united, and that's what we did. We stayed united. Hang on, I'm just about to call you. I'm just disentangling my head from it. Hang on, just a second. What's the biggest thought that we're taking away from this? So when Biden first raised, you know, autocracy and democracy at his first press conference a year ago, a year ago, uh, this wasn't this wasn't the battle he had in mind. Right. Right. This wasn't the battle that he had in mind. But at the same time, this has been the ongoing battle ever since the collapse 
of the old Soviet Union of the falling of the Berlin Wall during the ending part of Ronald Reagan's administration. This should have always been the battle in mind pertaining to this type of aggression coming from these oligarchs, these tyrants that want to basically do away with a free, fair, open, elected democracy. That now other countries that have pursued in the same avenue are being strained just as much, if not more, than what we are. I'm telling you, these are all attacks coming from the supernatural pertaining to the Luciferian Lucifer that is out to kill, steal, and destroy. And these are all diversions in diverting us from the areas of where we should be concentrating on that if we don't watch this Antichrist, Lucifer, is going to succeed by, by uh, causing so many distractions that we are not going to pay close enough attention in these phenomenon events that are happening worldwide that once we do finally put it on the burner of uh, prioritizing it on the front burner, then it will be too late. Then it will be too late. Because it has not yet been prioritized on a global level of taking these matters serious pertaining to what we are seeing now globally, phenomenally, on a global scale towards these massive major events these, these uh, forces of nature events that are only intensifying and getting worse rather than getting better. And I know I probably sound like an old record that just wants to com continue to keep repeating itself again and again and again. And I'm sure that other prophets of God, such as Noah and, and other uh, messengers that was called of God, sounded very, very similar towards sounding like an old record repeating itself again and again and again. But you know what? We can read and understand history that those same people that didn't pay enough attention to the delegated, selected people that was called of God of doing these things suffered immense consequences for not paying attention to the people that was giving out the messages. Are we tragically going to do the same? Are we going to continue to put things off on the back burner again and again and again? To the point that then it becomes too late. In other words, are we going to repeat the same scenarios that other generations before us created for themselves? By the way, this old barn right here that you're looking at was Almas and Oler's milk barn before they got grasped up enough money that they could... Uh, build a better milk barn that Mr. Elmas uh, worked for the agriculture uh, milk industry up until the time that he basically uh, retired that I just I just wanted to clarify that pertaining to the leaves changing here in front of my house at 291 Thompson Road as we fly the American flag in honor of our country and telling people that you better 
start paying better attention to what's going on because other generations didn't pay enough attention to what was going on and they suffered immense consequences for doing so. Thanks again. Good luck to us all. God bless. God bless America. God bless our endeavors where we go from here. And good luck to each and every one of us. Shalom.